OK, uh, well, thank you for for having me. So um, sorry for the late start. I hope you've had a better afternoon than me, but I've been marking uh, the student presentations all afternoon. So uh, hopefully, <clears throat> hopefully I'm not too shell shocked. Uh, but so this is a this is um, this talk is hopefully going to be something a little bit fun and uh, nice and easy for end of the day. So um, uh, Basically, it's about um, uh, uh, well, let's let's get into it. So, uh, about mimicking toric geometry um, in a setting that's kind of just outside of the toric world. Uh, so, uh, our favourite and most famous um, example of a flop that was mentioned in Gavin's talk is, of course, the Atiyah flop. So, this is a very simple uh, birational map that everyone uh, here knows. It's a birational map of three folds. Uh, 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 between smooth threefolds. Uh, yeah. Hello, is someone asking a question? Doesn't seem so just yet, but. Oh, I had some. Uh, I think it maybe was my um, speaker. Uh, so this is a map between two smooth threefolds, uh, which uh, is an isomorphism outside of a curve, and this curve is a smooth rational curve, which is uh, contracted to an ordinary threefold node and of course um, so this uh, this hypersurface singularity down here x y is equal to z t uh, this thing can be resolved in two different ways uh, as Gavin explained in his talk and so each of those two resolutions is um, on the side of a flop which everybody is uh, very familiar with and since this singularity is toric um, this flop can be realized in terms of toric geometry, so um, this um, this singularity y is um, uh, uh, can be given by a fan, or really in this case the fan is just a cone, and it's a square cone, uh, uh, and the two sides of the flop are just um, uh, realized by subdividing this cone into two smooth cones, and there's two different ways to do that, and those are the two sides of the flop. Uh, so. Uh, this singularity y is actually isomorphic to the cone over p1 cross p1 in its um, with its toric boundary uh, divisor, so the union of four four curves in self intersection zero curves here, and so the obviously the toric invariant strata of y correspond to the four um, uh, boundary components in this uh, toric uh, surface, and so um, this is all very nice because it reduces all of the questions of geometry and things down to just combinatorial messing around with fans in, in uh, lattices. But there are other types of, of flop, as Gavin mentioned. So Gavin um, mentioned this result actually due to Laufer, which is that if uh, you have a smooth flopping curve in a smooth threefold, then the normal bundle can take one of three forms. It can be O minus one, O minus one, O minus two, zero, or O minus three, one. And so the first type there, basically all of the flops of that form are all locally analytically isomorphic to the tier flop, so that's basically taking care of that whole one. And then, uh, uh, then there are these more exotic ones, but these can't be flopped torically because um, if I were to draw the cone of, uh, uh, if I were to draw the relevant cone for, for a toric curve with one of these two normal bundles, uh, then these are not strictly convex square cones, so there's no way to subdivide these in, into two. So a question that I'll just ask today is whether there's a kind of more exotic way to introduce a cone here that can be subdivided into two different ways that captures both sides of the flop uh, in the world of integral affine geometry rather than just uh, normal toric geometry. And so I'll do this for the uh, reads pagoda, which is a family of flops of the form O minus two zero. So let me recall what what reads pagoda is. So it's a it's a family of flops with normal bundle O minus two zero, and so it's a discrete family of flops. So there's one for every integer n, where n is some integer bigger than or equal to two, and it looks I mean it's basically pretty similar to the tier flop. So you begin with a hypersurface singularity, which of course, um, which so called y n here, and the t n and appears in the equation there. And then of course, exactly like the 
uh, a TFLOP example, there's two ways to resolve this um, singularity. There are two small resolutions of this thing, or I can introduce a ratio uh, X over Y, which is the same as Y plus T to the N over Z, or similarly, Y over Z, which is X plus uh, Y over T to the N. So that's, there are uh, two ways to factor that equation, and those are the two sides of the flop. And so why is it called uh, a pagoda? Well, the reason that Miles called this a pagoda is to do with the resolution of, of this flop. So if you want to resolve this flop, you can repeatedly blow up the curve that you're flopping n times. So if you blow it up once, you'll find uh, this is the pictures from his original paper, actually. So if you blow it up once, you'll find that the exceptional divisor is a Hertzebrook surface. F2. And if you blow up on both sides of the flop, you'll have uh, Hertzebrook surfaces. And then the induced map is a flop which flops the minus two curve in the Hertzebrook surface to the minus two curve in the Hertzebrook surface on the other side. And so, uh, and that's a flop of the form, that's a flop over y n minus one. So it's a, a pagoda flop of level one lower. And if you keep doing this and keep blowing it up, you end up with this tower of F2s, and then at the top level, when n is equal to one, the last exceptional divisor you blow up is, is a P1 cross P1. And uh, so it's a kind of, um, so basically the last flop, so if you blow up all of all n minus one levels apart from the last one, you're basically just doing an Atiyah flop, but it's a kind of non-toric Atiyah flop uh, because the equation, essentially it's the flop with the equation n is equal to one in this equation here. So it's kind of a non, it's presented to us non-torically. And the way it's viewed in this picture is that this P1 cross P1 at the top here is glued to the Hertzebrook surface below it along a, a curve of self-intersection two. So it's a it's a one, a, bi, a curve of bi degree one, one. And then this picture, this tower, this pagoda here, it has two rulings, which you can see from the top. And so, both either side of this flop is given by contracting this pagoda along one of the, each of these two two rulings that, that you see drawn in the picture there. So this is what I, I think of, this is just summarizing what I've just said. So every time you blow up, you find a Hertzebrook surface. And the top one is a P1 cross P1, which is glued to the last one on the curve of by degree one one. And so, um, so uh, now I'll explain how you can construct this pagoda kind of by mimicking toric geometry. So I want to associate a cone to this singularity yn, like we have the square cone that's associated to the um, uh, the, the singularity, the ordinary node, which is what the Atiyah flop is happening over. And so um, I well, let's we can think of y n similarly as the as a as a cone over a, a del pezzo surface with some overfold singularities. So, um, so one way to do that is to note that this surface, this equation, is weighted homogeneous with respect to these weights. So I can think about the the overfold del pezzo surface uh, inside this weighted projective space, and so it has uh, it's quite nice surface, it has exactly one cyclic quotient singularity, which is a cyclic quotient singularity of this uh, type at the point, uh, coordinate point uh, z corresponding to Z. And um, so my singularity YN, I want to think of as the cone over this del pezzo surface. And let's um, note that the canonical bundle of this surface is uh, ON plus one. So um, let's pick a nice divisor inside there. So if I, the um, variable y has degree n and the variable t has degree one. So if I look at this divisor here, uh, where y and t both, uh, either y or t vanishes, then this defines an anti-canonical divisor. And this anti-canonical divisor uh, splits into three components. So it's a nice um, reduced, cycle. So these are three rational curves that, that, that meet and uh, uh, that meet transversely, except that 
two of them. So I think it's uh, who is it? It's D1 and D3 actually meet at this uh, this singularity. But apart from that, they're intersecting nicely. Uh, and so this divisor. So the reason for choosing this is that, that this the boundary here is going to play the same role uh, that the um, it's going to frame my del pezzo surface in the same way that I previously had a P1 Ross P1 framed with its toric boundary. And that was the, the picture for the Atiyah flop. So um, what? how do we, um, I can explain to you how you can construct an analog of a fan for this for this pair, um, S, N and D. So it's not toric, but it's kind of almost toric in a sense. It's, uh, uh, if I resolve um, the singularity in this uh, in this rational surface here, uh, then I get a cycle with these um, self-intersection numbers, where the, the minus two and the minus n there are the one over two n singularity, cyclic quotient singularity. And so now I've drawn this line in the middle here. What what is the point of this line? Well, this line is the strict transform of the curve uh, where x and y plus t to the n vanish. So this is a rational curve and you can check now that it intersects the boundary uh, transversely in one point. So it must be a minus one curve and it's incident to this minus two uh, component in the boundary. So we can contract it to get this picture in the next step. And then uh, finally, we have a minus one curve here and we note that um, if I contract this minus one curve over here, then I get this nice um, Hertzebruck surface of Fn. And uh, the strict transform of the boundary now, so the boundary over here is just the standard toric boundary on Fn. So by a sequence of well, resolving the singularity and then doing a kind of non-toric blowdown and then a toric blowdown, I've arrived at the toric surface. So this is um, what's called a toric model of the of the pair S, N and, and D. And so, as I said, the pair S, N and D isn't toric, but it's a kind of simple blow up of a, of a toric variety. And so there's a way now to associate a fan to this pair so I can take the fan uh, uh, for the Hertzebruck surface, which I've blown up. So um, the Hertzebruck surface, uh, it had um, uh, the boundary components were D3, E2, D2 and D1. And then I blew up this component E1. And then I blew up a point along E1. And what that does in this picture is it changes the integral affine structure as I pass through this ray. So uh, there's a way to um, associate a fan to this uh, uh, this pair where I bend um, all of the lines that, that pass through this ray are now bending by the slope of that line bends by multiplication by this matrix here and it bends them towards the origin. So even though E1 looks like uh, uh, it should have self-intersection minus one when you compare it to D1 and E2 on either side, it really has minus two because of this bending that's going on. And so this this um, this bend in the inter in the affine structure means that um, well there is a consistent uh, 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 integral affine structure on this manifold, but it can't be extended at, at, at a singular point here, which is at the origin because it doesn't make sense to talk about straight lines passing through that point anymore. Uh, so, uh, uh, Tom, uh, yeah. this is the point at which I lose touch with the material. Could you uh, just repeat the explanation? I mean, where was, where was the original FN? scroll and it's blow up. Uh, how, do, how do you derive this picture from that? Uh, so this picture here, so the five the five points in, in this picture 
are the array of I, I guess this this um, middle the third uh, the third surface here, which is a toric surface. It's a, a toric blob of a Hertzbruck surface. And then that black dot on that minus one curve gets blown up. And the minus two and the minus n curve get contracted to this cyclic quotient singularity. So, uh, so the fan is, uh, so that, that black dot that gets blown up corresponds to this, this ray here. And this is the ray in which I'm going to bend uh, all of the lines that pass through this uh, towards the origin. Does that make, uh, was that an uh, explanation for that satisfied you, Mars? Well, uh, you have to proceed. Yeah. So, okay, so what it means is, so for example, this, this, this gray line, that's the um, right hand side of this uh, rational looking polygon that I've drawn, is actually straight in the affine structure that, that I'm defining in, in this in this manner in this affine manifold. Uh, because when it goes through uh, this ray, it bends uh, by the amount that I've prescribed by this non-toric blow up. And so uh, so actually this gray rational polygon here is really a, a, a lattice triangle, if you like. And this fan is actually the spanning fan of this lattice triangle. Uh, so, um, so that's, uh, here we have a triangle that's embedded in an integral affine manifold with a singularity. And so perhaps a different way to think about it is, um, in terms of the developing space of well of if, here is a picture this is essentially a picture of the universal cover of this triangle that i've just defined on the previous slide so if i start over here at the blue vertex d2 and i move around uh, uh, clockwise uh, counterclockwise uh, then i when i pass through this this ray that i've done this non-toric blow up at i wrap onto this black sheet and then as I go around the black sheet, I wrap onto the red sheet. So basically, uh, if I'm standing at this uh, black point here, which is the point uh, black uh, D3 vertex, and I look to the left of the singularity, I see D2 at the lattice point uh, in black. And if I look to the right of the singularity, I see D1 at this red lattice point here. So whenever I do any kind of computation in terms of the uh, lattice or the integral structure here, I have to make sure that I'm looking at the right sheet of this uh, picture on the uh, left hand side of this singularity and the right hand side. Uh, so let me now give you a kind of a combinatorial model of this flop. So the flop now corresponds to contracting, um, well, I have the I have my singularity, which is the cone over this del pezzo surface. And this del pezzo surface has, has two rulings, basically the, the two rulings that, that we used to um, define the flop previously. And so these, so if I look at, um, if I look at the, uh, the general um, uh, member of, uh, you know, the general um, curve of the form AX plus BY is equal to zero, then it's a smooth rational curve inside this Hertzbruck, uh, inside this surface, and it intersects uh, on the either intersects D2 transversely and D3 transversely, which is what this picture on the left is supposed to show, or it intersects D1 and D3 transversely, which is what this picture on the right is supposed to show. And so, um, uh, if we look at this this um, lattice triangle that I've defined, and uh, for the time being, let's um, uh, I'll show you that there there are two exactly two lines inside this triangle. That uh, so there's a line in this triangle that goes from D3 to D2, 
which we can see if we slide this singularity to the left. Uh, when this line crosses this ray, it then goes on to hit D2. And if I were to slide this singularity to the right, uh, the same line that emanates from D3 goes on to hit D1. And so the point at which um, moving this singularity from left to right changes this line, this uh, curve from hitting D2 to hitting D1 is when uh, uh, the singularity is placed at the point in minus one over M plus one uh, and zero. And so uh, if I choose the singularity to be at this point, then I can see kind of these two um, these two subdivisions of, of this of this triangle at the same time, and this subdivided. So these two subdivided divisions, this kind of path from D3 to D2, uh, and this path from D3 to D1, uh, are supposed to represent two uh, rulings of the of the surface that 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 um, uh, I just described. And so. This is what I want to take as the kind of the combinatorial model now of this flop. And so how can I, so this was, this is so far I've been talking in terms of a, of a surface, Sn, but um, we know that this singularity is, is the cone over this surface. Uh, uh, and so it's, uh, we know that um, the, the surface has a canonical bundle On plus one. And so uh, normally in the toric case, what that means is that the vertices of whatever polytope it is that, that is spanning, uh, that is generating the fan of your Fano variety span up sub lattice of, of that index. And that also happens in this case. So Yn is, is the cone over Sn, but with respect to the line bundle O1. So um, I want to think now of taking this this triangle in this affine manifold that I found and lifting it and uh, making a cone over it, but not a cone over it in, in the lattice that we started with in this um, lattice. Well, it's not really a sub lattice because um, uh, it's in an integral affine manifold, but uh, with the affine structure given here with these bl black uh, heavy vertices being the kind of um, the lattice that, that I'm interested in. And uh, so if I do that, so now I want to think that, that this is lifted in, into height one and I've taken a cone over it from uh, the origin at the bottom there. And then this this singular point becomes a, a ray of singularities that, that emanates out of the page. And so if I do that, I get something that 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 is a cone in a, in now in a three dimensional integral affine manifold. And if I slice this cone at, at various heights, then I'll see the lattice points that, that live in this cone. So this picture is is showing me uh, at height one, height two and height three, all of the the integral lattice points that that, that live inside this this cone viewed as an integral affine manifold. And so um, now I can resolve it. I can start resolving this cone just as you would uh, in normal toric geometry. So, uh, so for example, in height two here, we see, so the three vertices of the triangle in, in height one uh, if I look at the sums, then I get the, the points on the midpoints of all the edges here. And so this vertex, this black vertex in the middle is, is a kind of uh, um, extra lattice point that appears in height two. And so in toric geometry, what you would do to resolve the, the singularity defined by this cone is to start subdividing at that lattice point and so on. And so uh, uh, we can do that. So we just subdivide this, this guy into smooth cones exactly as you would in the in the toric setting. And so um, uh, this first subdivision corresponds to a blow up and then uh, uh, another blow up. And then uh, finally in height four, I get this, um, this blow up up here. And so uh, uh, this uh, picture now on the right hand side here 
this actually this resolution here actually corresponds to the the pagoda so uh, this the pagoda now is is the dual thing to this resolution and so you can read off the intersection numbers of everything involved just as you would in normal toric geometry and so of course if I, if I were to draw a point inside each one of these triangles and then join up the ones that meet in an edge I'd, I'd find this picture here of the pagoda and the top component of this pagoda which is the point at which this uh, which lives in at the point of this singular ray is a, a non-toric p1 cross p1 and the boundary divisor is the union of three um, curves a curve of by degree 0 1 1 0 and 1 1 so everything in this picture looks toric except for this top level here which is corresponding to this singular ray and uh, so you can also blow down the same way that you would in toric geometry so you can then blow down along these two rulings same way that you would uh, in the toric picture to get this 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 resolution that that, that, that well, this picture of, of the combinatorial picture of this flop that, that I, I claimed uh, so that was the that's the kind of the nice toy picture of of, of the flop here in terms of this um, uh, two sub the, the two different subdivisions of this this cone in this integral I find manifold and so uh, earlier I mentioned that you could slide the singular point in this manifold around a little bit and so why was why was it the right place to uh, why was it the right thing to do was to put this singularity at the point that I uh, that I put it at n of minus one over n plus one is zero. And what does it mean for me to move this singularity around? So let me explain now geometrically what, what it means to let this um, singularity, this this ray of singularities move around in this in this cone. And if I move it all of the way out of the out of the um, of the 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 cone itself then then I'll show you how you can use it to construct a toric model for this for this pagoda so here is the uh, a two a two level pagoda and here is the, the the pagoda resolution on the left hand side and the red ray is the is the ray of, uh, where I'm the red x is the singular locus and this red ray is where I'm bending so the singularity here in this picture is occurring exactly on the ray corresponding to this this component in the divisor which is not toric and the reason it's not toric well it's obviously not a toric pair and it has two red curves so these two red curves inside this that i've drawn inside this triangle are um uh, but they're basically this red curve on the right is the curve that I blew up when I constructed the the, the toric. It was the non-toric blow up that I did. The, the exceptional curve of the non-toric blow up I did when I when I built the, the fan for the um, uh, the surface SN. And so, as I said, everything in this picture kind of works like it would in toric geometry. So you can start blowing up cone so I can blow up a point on if I subdivide the edge over here and subdivide this cone into two it corresponds to blowing up this blue uh, uh, exceptional divisor over here and then I can keep subdividing and I can blow up enough times so that um, I've resolved uh, 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 so that um, yeah I've, I've um, introduced um, uh, something along this ray here and so um, the point now is uh, now that I've, I've, I've made myself a path that goes from the outside of this cone to the to the singular point in this uh, affi manifold uh, this um, red curve this non this this bad curve that I had in here that was causing the singularity uh, once I do this final blow up it becomes a 
a flow is it becomes a minus one curve inside the surface here and inside the threefold it becomes a, a flopping curve with um, a normal bundle o minus one o minus one so i can start uh, uh, flopping this red curve on the inside of this exceptional divisor over here which will correspond to moving this singularity around in, inside this affine manifold on the left. So first of all, I could make a small contraction of it, and that corresponds to pushing out this singularity into, uh, uh, into this um, uh, one-dimensional uh, face, the face between these two cones here. And that, so basically the, the point at which this ray lives is, is telling you where this kind of uh, discrepancy in the toric structure is, is living over here. And that's, when I've contracted this small curve, it's living somewhere inside this, uh, uh, in this one dimensional stratum, which corresponds to this, um, uh, this one, this um, bit over here. And if I push it, keep pushing it further to the right, and eventually it hits the uh, the next vertex, which is when it becomes, uh, 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 when it gets resolved and flopped out into the next component here. And so this component was a P1 cross P1, which means that there was a red, uh, there was the faint red curve was a, was a curve of degree zero, uh, self intersection zero. And so when I resolve this um, flop on the other side, the fiber, which has the degree uh, zero in, in this surface, is now a pair of minus one curves, minus one curves. And so uh, now I can, if I want to keep pushing, I can start by flopping and contracting the, the next minus one curve. So I get a picture like this, where this used to be a P1 cross P1, and now it's become a Hertzebrook surface F1. And eventually, I can push it all the way to the boundary here. And when it hits this last vertex, I, I pull out this uh, minus one curve at the end here. And then if I just carry on, I can push this thing completely out of the picture. And then this leaves me now with something that's manifestly uh, toric. So I've got a toric uh, uh, variety here, just defined by the fan that I've got drawn on the left here. And so uh, now that gives me a way to construct the original pagoda now just from, from this toric variety. So if I take this toric variety that I've got here and I blow up this red curve uh, in the boundary uh, and then I undo all of those flops that I just did and then I contract all of these divisors, then I get back to the pagoda. So it gives you an explicit way to construct a toric model of Reed's pagoda, so I, it's birational to a toric variety that, that, that I've just defined, uh, uh, and this is a kind of pictorial graphic process that, that shows you why. Um, so the kind of good thing about toric geometry is that um, you don't just have um, one side of a picture. So this is all in, in, in terms of fans, which is uh, a kind of um, uh, lattice of toric divisorial valuations. So in toric geometry, you don't just have um, uh, uh, one uh, lattice, but you also have a dual lattice. And then um, if you have uh, cones or uh, things in, in one lattice, then, then you can um, dualize it to the other. So in toric geometry, the dual lattice is lattice M of, of monomials. And the intersection pairing between those two lattices is, is given by evaluating the order of vanishing of, of, a, of a monomial on a, on a component of, uh, on a divisor that corresponds to some, some vertex. And you can also construct a dual cone uh, to uh, uh, in you can also there's you can also extend duality in, in this setting. So there should be a dual uh, cone in a dual integral affi manifold. And the lattice points in this manifold, affi manifold, will correspond to a certain additive 
basis of monomials in, in the coordinate ring of this hypersurface Yn, just like they do, uh, just like in, in toric geometry, the, the monomials are, uh, well, they're, they're genuine, mon they're the monomials of, of, the, tor of the torus, so uh, uh, x to plus or minus one, y plus or minus one, etc. And uh, so in this example, we can we can construct this this manifold in a slightly ad hoc way. We can glue together two copies of um, R2 times uh, the half line R greater than or equal to zero, where the integral points in each half are parameterized by monomials um, of the form x to the a, y to the b, t to the c, where a is positive and b and c are anything. That's the uh, one half of the picture. And the other half of the picture, I, y, I have monomials of the form y to the b, t to the c, and z to the d, where b and c are positive and d can now be, uh, d has to be positive, sorry, and b and c can be anything. And uh, uh, we want to these affine manifolds to be dual to each other, where the intersection, so the idea is that the whole point of this construction is that we want these affine manifolds to be dual to one another. The intersection pairing now given by computing the order of vanishing of a monomial along some boundary divisor. And so to get the right affine structure on this space, we might want to consider the order of vanishing of, of each of the four monomials x, y, z and t along the boundary divisors. And so because, of course, these functions are not monomial anymore, they're uh, given in terms of, of a binomial expression. Uh, this order of vanishing is only a piecewise linear function in general. And here in this picture, I've drawn some, uh, I've drawn for the cone that, that I defined, I've drawn some lines which show you how the order of vanishing of x works along along the boundary divisors. So x, for example, it vanishes on uh, on this top right hand vertex, and it's uh, non vanishing on the on the two vertices on the left there. And this picture, you have to remember, it's in three dimensions, so it's really a cone. And so this these lines here are, are telling you uh, what the va you know these are kind of the lines corresponding to x uh, takes a value pairing with x takes a certain value on 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 these lines that that are now lifted up in in three space and similarly for y and for z and for t and so uh, so uh, if we if we take the um, the three boundary components uh, and they so these are three, um, I can choose what points uh, that they correspond to, but they were, they were points in the lattice. So uh, if you think that, um, so they're all lifted to height one, which is why the, the last coordinate there is, is equal to one, and then, and then they, uh, D3 is above the origin, then D2 and D1 have to generate a, 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 a lattice, of, uh, generate a standard lattice. So uh, these are th three possibilities for, this is just a possibility for, for the, um, where we can take these uh, of vertices that we can use for these three points. And so then if you look at the, uh, at the um, order of, if you look at these pictures that I drew on, on this side uh, with the, with the, with d1, d2, and d3 corresponding to these vertices in n, then we um, would expect y, x, y, and t to correspond to these lattice points in the dual lattice because they look like um, pairing against, uh, they all, they're all flat, so they just look like pairing against some vector. But the problem here is, is z, and z has this bending along this, along this ray the ray where uh, um, things were allowed to bend. 
And so, I mean, if I look on the top light, if I look to the at the top of this line, it looks like Z is given by pairing with one vector. And if I look in the bottom of uh, underneath that, that, um, that ray, it looks like Z should be given by pairing with a different vector. And then the ambiguity in choice there is just due to the presence of a singularity in this um, in this dual space. And so you can build a cone, uh, uh, basically, um, so the cone on the left here, so this picture on the left here represents a cone where I've taken Z to be one of these uh, 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 vertices, uh, and this picture on the right is a, is a cone where it's a cone over a polytope where I've taken Z to be the other one. And then there's some uh, singularity that lies in the in the plane that I've glued along, which is the plane going through uh, the point T and the point Y in this picture. And so, uh, so this dual cone is the cone in this affine manifold spanned by these four monomials. So it either looks like this or, or like this, depending on which one of these two choices you make for Z. Uh, but um, so. The reason that this is this is nice is that now we can dualize cones in in N to get cones in M by using the intersection pairing. So what happens if we do this for our flop? Because the nice thing about um, the Atiyah flop is that I can dualize the two the two cones in my subdivision to get two affine patches on the flop. And so we'd like to do something similar in this setting. So uh, if I take one side of the flop here, which is given by this um, subdividing this cone according to this picture, and uh, so I can take the, um, there's a convex subcone here, which is spanned by D2 and D3, uh, and it's the, given by the gray region now in this picture. And I look at all of the monomials in M that have a positive pairing against either D2 or D3. So all of the monomers that vanish against along D2 or D3, then I can glue, I can basically obtain a cone that's dual to these two divisors by um, gluing together the cones in the different halves of, of M. So actually, if I just um, uh, look in the two different halves of M, then I have a cone, then, then uh, in the in the in the side where I take x, I see that x, y, and t. Uh, uh, this dual cone is given by things generated by x, y, and t. And if I look on the right, then um, well, uh, what happens? So uh, I've got y, z over y, and t. So that's because um, so I'm looking at on the left hand side of this lattice triangle. And um, uh, y vanishes on uh, the top vertex, and so does z. So I can consider the fraction z over y, and that also uh, uh, plays nicely on the bottom vertex. And so if I then look at the two um, uh, uh, halves of this cone, I, I get uh, something that's generated now by four uh, lattice points. And these generate a ring for me, which is uh, exactly one half, a uh, one patch of, of affine patch of the flop that, that I was um, trying to construct. Um, but there's a problem, which is um, what happens to the other piece of this decomposition. So the other piece of this decomposition here is not convex. And so uh, because, of course, the convex hull of these three points is the whole cone itself. And so, um, uh, uh, so when I dualize it, I'm just going to get the the coordinate ring of y and the original singularity, and the function which I want, which is the coordinate on the on the other on the other side of the flop, the function that I, that I wanted to find is not even uh, won't even appear anyway because it's not a monomial in our distinguished basis of of um, uh, distinguished additive basis for this for this um, uh, ring. So uh, so it's kind of a, a, an imperfect analogy here because um, so 
I can find one affine patch of the flock in the, in the same way that I would using toric geometry, but I'm not really sure quite uh, how I'm how this thing really corresponds to the other patch. So this is a something that I haven't been able to wrap my head around. Uh, but so let me just uh, uh, finish by um, posing a question. So there is an obvious question now, which is this was a family of O minus two zero flops. And so there's a question which is whether we can construct any flops with normal bundle O minus three one. And so, for example, the simplest or well, the first kind of example of an O minus three one flop was was given by Laufer. And it's a flop over a CD4 hypersurface singularity. So this is like what uh, Gavin was talking about the other day. And so if we were to just follow our approach kind of quite naively, we would want to consider that this is the this singularity is a cone over a weighted del pezzo surface. And you can give weights to these variables that, that, that make this into a weighted homogeneous equation. And the weights are four, six, seven, and nine. And this del pezzo surface then has degree 18. And unfortunately, this thing uh, doesn't have a very nice anti-canonical linear system. So uh, uh, minus Ks here is uh, 08. And so the only thing that, that it contains is x squared, which is a bit of a problem uh, because it doesn't contain any nice reduced cycles. And so there's no way to make this surface into a louis Younger pair, which was then the starting point of writing down this fan and, and, and this um, triangle and then lifting it to I1 and all of the stuff that I did before. So, so that's a kind of a, a problem. In fact, I think probably, I don't, I mean, I'm assuming, in fact, that uh, none of the O minus three one flops will actually work this way. Um, but I don't know proof of that. Um, but I'm thinking that this is a this is a kind of semi stable uh, phenomenon. And so um, I'm finishing a little bit early, but uh, I don't suppose anyone uh, will mind. So that was uh, all I really wanted to say. So end of my talk.